the ear. The ear consists of three parts. External, also known as outer, middle, and inner. Uh, we have a model that looks like this in the lab. Um, we will probably do it today after the, um, the quiz. And the external starts from the auricle to the external acoustic canal to the tympanic membrane. So it starts from the auricle, which is this, the penna. The auricle is the same as the penna, as I mentioned, and I mentioned that several times. Anytime you see two or three names for the same structure, you have to know it. If you know that the auricle, auricle is the same as penna, you have to know both of them. Every time a station tube has three different names, you have to know the names. Otherwise, you study and see the answer and you don't get it because you remember something and you don't remember the other name. So, auricle is the same as penna. And then we have the external acoustic canal and it will end at the tympanic membrane, also known as eardrum. So, start from here and end at the eardrum. What's the function of the auricle? Direct, it direct the sound and funnel it in to go all the way to um, the tympanic membrane, which is the eardrums, and it's protective to the canal. Followed by the external acoustic canal, and canal is not the same as tube, okay? You will see later on, you will see a tube canal does not change the shape. This is canal. If it's a tube, it can open and close. It's different. So, because there is an auditory canal and auditory tube, and you can be confused, it's different. So, canal is this, right after your auricle, you're entering to the canal, not the tube. We will see the tube later on. So, the external acoustic canal, not tube, it's a canal, it will end at the tympanic membrane, which is known as the eardrum. And the eardrum is separating the middle the external and the middle ear. There, there are glands inside our ears that's called the ceraminous glands. And the ceraminous glands, usually, most of the time, the name of the gland comes from the secretion. So the name give it away. If you know it's ceraminous gland, it will secrete cerumen. If it is sebaceous gland, it will secrete sebum. If it is serous gland, it will, it will secrete serum, and so on. So usually the name of the gland will come from the secretion. So the serum, uh, the cerumen, uh, is a secretion from the ceraminous gland, and this is a waxy material that we all know when you clean your ear or something, there is this ear, ear wax. This is actually called the cerumen, and the cerumen is there to protect our tympanic membrane, specifically. This is a very delicate structure. It can be uh, injured, it can be ruptured very easily if there is something that can enter in, so it trap anything that goes in beside the antimicrobial um, properties of the cerumen. So this is the function of the cerumen um, in our outer ear. And I, I think I mentioned that before, but um, I remember one time when I was in the hospital, um, I was in the ER and uh, I saw a baby coming and re crying really uh, crazy. He was not a baby, he was a child actually. And um, it was actually a, a fly or a mosquito inside his ears, and it was stuck in this cerumen. And this fly was trying to really fly, or the mosquito trying to really fly, but the legs were stuck in this um, waxy material, so it's, it was really horrible. The closer you get to the tympanic membrane, the louder the voice, so it was driving him crazy. And what we did is we just added a couple of drops of uh, oil, warm oil. So the oil killed the mosquito and air wash and we get rid of it, but it's, it was really horrible. This is the waxy material, the serum that actually trap anything trying to get in, whether we're talking about, it, it, does, it does happen actually. So mosquito, uh, dust, anything that can get in, it should be trapped in the serum, which is the waxy material protecting the eardrums. The next part will be the middle ear. So we did the external ear, and the external ear end at tympanic membrane. Tympanic membrane. This is the separation between external and metal. The metal ear, also known as a tympanic cavity, again, two names for the same structure. Metal ear, tympanic cavity, same thing. 
You can see it in the answer. What is this compartment that contains the three ossicles? Uh, it's the middle ear. Middle ear is not in the answers. Tympanic cavity, same thing. Okay, so this is how it goes. And this tympanic membrane or middle ear contains the three auditory ossicles that we will talk about. And also, it communicates with the pharynx through or the nasopharynx specifically through something called auditory tube. An auditory tube is the same as eustachian tube. It's the same as pharyngeal tympanic tube. It's tube anyway, not a canal. So three names for the same structure, and yes, you have to know the three names. Eustachian tube is the same as auditory tube, is the same as pharyngeal tympanic tube. The three of them are tubes. So if you see canal, you're talking about something else. So auditory tube versus auditory canal. Both of them start with auditory. You can be confused. But this is a tube, this is a canal. This is the canal outside here. The tube is inside, and this is where, I think we have a picture for that. I will show you later on. But this is where, if you are like in the, um, um, in the aeroplane or something, and you start to feel like this pressure or tinnitus or loud noise or something like that, and they ask you, you can um, open your uh, mouth wide or you can chew a gum or something, right? If you ever get through this situation and they ask you to chew a gum, and that's because the, the pressure outside, which is the atmospheric pressure on one side, this is the, the, the eardrums or the tympanic membrane. The pressure here is just the atmospheric pressure, right? The pressure in, in your mouth is the same as atmospheric pressure. But the connection between this side, which is the middle ear, and the mouth is this auditory tube, and it can actually close and open. So if it close, it means that the eardrum is subjected to do different pressures, right? One side is the atmospheric pressure, and the, uh, and the other side is usually less, because the tube that's supposed to communicate between those two compartments and it should communicate with the external um, or the atmospheric pressure is blocked. So that's why if you do this, if you do something like that or shoe a gum, you will open the auditory tube or the eustachian tube, and this will make an equilibrium on either side of the tympanic membrane, and that should relieve the pressure that we feel. So this is all about the auditory tube, eustachian tube, pharyngeal tympanic tube, same thing. The three, os the three ossicles are called malleus, incus, and stapes. And the translation of that from Greek to English is, malleus means hammer. So this is the hammer. Incus means anvil. And stapes means stirrup. So it looks like this, like this. So hammer, we know how the hammer looks like, which is this part here. The, um, the, the incus, which is the anvil, looks like this. This is where the name came from. So the three ossicles got the name from how they look like. Look like a hammer, look like an anvil, look like a stirrup. And stirrup is this one. This is when you're, if you're riding a horse or something, you put your foot, right, on the stirrup, and then you can ride the horse. So it looks like this. And the, the, the arrangement is important. It goes like Milius Incus Stapis, Miss, like Miss USA, Miss, M-I-S. So from outside to inside, M-I-S, malleus, incus, stapes. Yes, the arrangement is important. From outside to inside, mess, M-I-S, malleus, incus, stapes. Okay? These are the three together. So obviously the malleus being the outer one is attached to the tympanic membrane. The, malleus, um, the incus will be the middle one. And then the stapes is the last one. The stapes will end at something called the oval window, and the oval window is the entrance to the inner ear. Here is the auditory tube again. So here's what I was talking about. If you are in the aeroplane or something, this side is opened all the time, it doesn't close. So this, this side of the eardrum is always atmospheric pressure, right? This side is different. If this tube is closed, the pressure here will be less than this. So when you chew a gum or open your mouth wide, this will open. The, the, the pressure here is the same as here. It's external pressure, atmospheric pressure. So it will be equal on either side 
of the tympanic membrane. Are we following so far? So what happens when you're in a plane? What happens is your, your auditory tube close, okay, because of the pressure. The pressure is different and the tube is soft, so it's usually close. If it close, now the pressure on either side is not equal. This is atmospheric and this is a closed cavity pressure. So on either side, it's not the same. So if there is pressure on one side that's different from the other side, this will be pushing or pulling the a drum. It can actually rupture if, if it is severe change. And that's why the pilots should not change the, the, uh, the altitude really quick because if the pressure change all of a sudden, you're going to stretch this. It's going to be stretched. It will be pushed from here and pulled from here. So it can actually rupture. And that's why when you open your mouth, this tube will open, and the pressure here in your mouth, which is the atmospheric pressure, and the pressure here in your ear, which is the atmospheric pressure, on both sides will be equal, and this is what you need to keep your eardrums safe, okay? And this is what happens if you're an airplane or something, you need to make the pressure equal on either side. One side is the, um, the auditory canal or the acoustic canal, it's the same thing. External auditory canal, external acoustic canal, it's canal anyway, okay? It's the same thing. Acoustic, translation, auditory, it's the same thing, okay? And here you have auditory tube, station tube, pharyngeotympanic tube, three names, you see it in this. So the three names are important, and you can see any one of those. So now the sound is entering and funneled in through your auricle, which is called the penna. It entered to the acoustic canal, external acoustic canal. It goes all the way to the tympanic membrane, and this is the end of the external uh, ear. And the, the sound entering is nothing but air vibration, vibration of the air. This vibration will vibrate and move the eardrums. The eardrums will move the three ossicles until the last part. And what's the arrangement from outside to inside? Malleus, incus, stapes. And the stapes looks like this, right? Looks like the stirrup. So this is oval shaped end of the stapes will fit into an oval shaped window, which is the entrance of the next compartment, which is the inner ear. Okay, so, so far the air pressure vibration which is the sound will enter, moving the eardrums, the eardrums moving, the eardrums is attached to the malleus, which make a joint to the incus, which make a joint to the stapes. The stapes has an oval end that will fit into an oval window, which is the entrance of the, in the inner ear, which is the next part. There are a couple of muscles that we need to know, tensor, tympanic, Tympani muscle, I mean, tensor tympani muscle. And the tensor tympani muscle, from the name tensor tympani. Tympani means the tympanic membrane, which is the eardrums. Tensor means tense. So this is obviously the muscle that will make the tympanic membrane tense or stiff, right? The name gave it away. Tensor tympani. Tense the tympanic membrane or make it stiff. Stapedius muscle, that will reduce the movement of the stapes, because you cannot leave the stapes like this moving all the time in the oval window. This will disrupt the inner ear fluid too much, and it will produce, it produce a lot of stimulation. So you need to reduce and control the movement a little bit, and this will be its stapedius muscle. And stapedius is coming from stapes, S-T-A-P-E. So this is the, 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 the first part, give it away. Stapedius, stapes, stapedius, stapes, reduce the stapes. The next part will be the inner ear. And the inner ear is two parts. Actually, it's th three parts and two layers. Let's say it this way. Um, there is fluid inside the inner ear that's called the endolymph. And this is surrounded by bone. You will see it in the lab today if you're Thursday lab. And this is called the bony labyrinth. And inside the bony labyrinth, there is a membranous labyrinth. So if this is your inner ear, this is bone, which is the bony labyrinth. This is membrane, which is the membranous labyrinth. And inside this, you have fluid. 
okay? And it's subdivided into three parts, vestibule, semicircular canal, and cochlea. So if you look at this picture, and we do have a model like this, these are the three semicircular canals, and semicircular means half a circle, so we have three half circles. This is part. The second part is here, which is the vestibule, and the inner part, which is snail-shaped, snail and this is called the cochlea. Most important thing to know here is what is the function of each one of those, and this can be important for both lecture and lab. Okay, there is a word, at least, that you need to remember, or two words from each one of those, and this is very important to remember, this is the core. The vestibule, this is number one. The vestibule will contain utricle and saccule. Look at this picture again. One side is the semicircular canals. The other side is the cochlea. The vestibule is the middle part. Are we following? This is the inner ear. One side is the cochlea, one side is the semicircular canals, three semicircular canals, and the middle part is called the vestibule. The vestibule contains utricle and saccule. What's the function, which is the most important? Sense of gravity and linear acceleration. This is the basic. These are the basics of this part. You have to remember the function, the basic function of each one of those. What's the function of the vestibule? What's the function of the semicircular canals? And what's the function of the cochlea? Vestibule, which is the middle part. Gravity and linear acceleration. Gravity and linear acceleration. How about the semicircular canals? The semicircular canals, rotation. If you forgot it, semicircular canal looks like a circle, right? Half a circle. So remember the, cir the circle rotate, right? So when you do this movement, this will be picked up by semicircular canals. It's rounded, and it has different directions. So semicircular canal looks like a circle, so this is rotational movement. The other thing is, it's not here, but um, I will add it. You, you will still need to know it. This is called dynamic equilibrium, the other name for rotation. So when you do this, you're rotating, and you should keep the equilibrium in a dynamic movement. So you're moving you still have the equilibrium, or you still keep your equilibrium through the semicircular canals. So these are the two things that we need to know here. Rotation and what? Dynamic equilibrium. Rotation and dynamic equilibrium. The vestibule and the semicircular canals together, we call it the vestibular complex. So the vestibule by itself is vestibule, which is the utricle and saccule. If you added the semicircular canal to it, now we call it the vestibular complex. The next part is the cochlea, and the cochlea is responsible for hearing, hearing. So one more time, what's the function of the vestibule? Gravity and linear acceleration. What's the function of the semicircular canals? Rotation and? Dynamic equilibrium. What's the function of the cochlea? Hearing. Hearing. This is the most important thing here. Okay? The cochlea contain different ducts. One of them is called the cochlear duct, which is uh, in, within the membranous labyrinth, and we will see that. At the end of the, um, uh, the inner ear, there is a round window. So you will see in the lab, you will see two windows. One of them is oval shaped, and the other one is round shaped. We have two windows. The round shape, or the round window, is a membranous partition. It's a window, but it's a covered by membrane. It's not open. It's covered by a membrane. Okay, and this will separate the perilymph from the air spaces of the middle ear. Okay, so we have this membrane that's covering the round ear, because the round ear is the last part of the, of the inner ear, and it should be separated. And it will make more sense when you see it actually in the lab, but for now, it separates the perilymph from the air spaces. So the entrance, the entrance of the inner ear is the oval window. The entrance to the inner ear is oval window. Uh, look at this picture. You see this window? Can you all see this? 
This is the oval window. It's oval shaped window. And this is where the stapes will push in and out. Okay? You're moving the stapes. How did you move the stapes? From the anchors, from the malleus, from the tympanic membrane, right? You're moving the tympanic membrane. The malleus is attached to the tympanic membrane. Malleus, anchors, stapes, and stapes will push this like a piston. If you're familiar with the piston, and it will push through the oval window, which is the entrance of the inner ear. And when you do this, there is a fluid inside, and you're going to move the fluid inside. When you move the fluid, it will circulate through this, and it will try to exit. Try. It does not. Exit from the round window. And the round window actually have a membrane, so when the pressure of the fluid increases, it, it will bulge a little bit, and then it will go back. So this is to, um, to take the pressure of the fluid as it changes. The, cha the fluid pressure increase, it's going to distend. If the pressure decreases, it will go back. So this is like to accommodate, accommodate the change in the pressure. This is a membrane of the round window, right? Are we following? You move through the oval window. The, the piston shaped or the stapes will move, will get in and out of the oval window. This is going to move the fluid inside. When you move the fluid, it will go all the way to the round window. There is a membrane that's going to move to absorb and um, alleviate the change in the pressure of the lymph, of the endolymph and perilymph. The round window, as we mentioned, and then the oval window connected to the base of the stapes. And by the way, for some reason, I see some students confusing the base of the stapes from the oval window because the base of the stapes is oval and the oval window is oval. But the base of the stapes is part of the bone. The oval window is a window. It's within the vestibule. I saw that so many times. You said the oval window, and this looks oval. Yes, but this is bone. This is the end of the stapes. The base of the stapes is oval. The windows is also oval, but these are two different things. The oval base of the stapes will fit into the oval window. The oval window is a window in the vestibule, which is part of the inner ear. Are we following? Are we following? Okay. So equilibrium... Is the function of the vestibular complex. What's a vestibular complex? The vestibule and the semicircular canals together. Together. So those two parts together are called the vestibular complex. Both of them are responsible for equilibrium. Okay? What type of equilibrium? Dynamic equilibrium in a semicircular canal and the static equilibrium, which is gravity and linear acceleration, and this is of the vestibule, okay? So that's why they put them together as a complex. So equilibrium. Equilibrium. There are two types of equilibrium. Dynamic and static. Dynamic is rotation. Static is gravity and linear acceleration. Okay? This is by the semicircular canals. And this is by the vestibule. Those two together are called vestibular complex. Okay? That's why equilibrium is a shared function of both of them together. One of them is dynamic and the other one is static. Dynamic is rotational movement. Yes. Yes, this is where like if you are in the car and you stop all of a sudden or if you accelerate all of a sudden, okay, this is called the linear, or if you run and then stop all of a sudden so, and, and then you run again, the, the running is the linear acceleration. You're accelerating in a line. So this should be picked up 
by uh, the vestibule, linear acceleration. When you accelerate in a linear pattern, okay? So like you're driving a car or you're running or something, this is a linear acceleration versus this, which is rotation. So these are two different things. So now we have external, metal, and inner ear. External ear, pick up the sound, reflected on the movement of the tympanic membrane. The middle ear is the bone part that takes the movement from the tympanic membrane all the way to the oval window. And the inner contains fluid that when the stapes move, the fluid will move in. When the fluid moves, what does it do? It's going to move something called the hair cells. And when you move the hair cells, you are going to create an action potential. This action potential will travel through the vestibulococcular nerve, which is the nerve number, what? Eight, yes, vestibulococcular nerve, this is nerve number eight. Vestibulococcular nerve will take this action potential and send it to the brain. To which part of the brain? Temporal lobe, yes. The temporal or temporal lobe. Does the whole 233 evaporate it? Is it all gone? You still remember part? Okay, um, even if you, if you forget, we're going to refresh the parts that's related to what we're doing now. So um, at the end, you go to the auditory cortex. Where is the auditory cortex? Again? If you forgot it, where are your ears? Where is the temporal loop? Right beside it, right? So it's here. So even if you forgot it, it's right here, the temporal loop. So anyway, at the end, this fluid movement is going to move the hair cells, and the hair cells are the receptors that are going to change the mechanical movement of the fluid into an action potential, which is electrical signal. And obviously, the electrical signal is what's actually going to travel through the nerve number eight, which is vestibulococcular nerve, and it will go all the way until it reaches the auditory cortex. Okay? The semicircular canals are actually three. We have anterior, posterior, and lateral. So by those three together, you can pick up any rotational movement, not necessarily this. It can be this. This is considered rotation, or this. Any, any type of rotation will be picked up because they have three different directions. It's like this, this, and this. You will see it in the lab. So it's taking all directions, so whatever the rotational movement you're doing, it will be picked up by one of these semicircular canals, or ducts. At the base of each one of, this, of these semicircular canals, there is an ampulla that contains copula, and the copula is gelatinous material at the, the, the ampulla. An ampulla means wide part of the tube. So the base of each one of these tubes will contain the ampulla, and the, the ampulla contain the copula, which contain the receptors at the base of each one of those. At the, at the surface of the hair cells, we have the stereocilia. And one, one of these cilia, which is a single and large, is called the, the kinocilium. This is just reviewing all what we talked about, which is gravity and linear acceleration, vestibule. Okay, rotation and dynamic equilibrium, semicircular canals. Hearing or sound, cochlea. Don't forget that. We said that the vestibule contains utricle and saccule, which is the two components of the vestibule, which will provide the equilibrium sensation. The clusters of the, air, of the hair cells are called the maculae, and there, is, there are some calcium carbonate crystals that are densely packed, and this is called the statoconia at the top of, of the surface of the gelatinous material. And this is how we do the equilibrium. It goes like this. If you have like jello, 
in a container or you put it like on a plate or something and you put something solid on it like this is carbonate calcium carbonate and you start to move the jello right if you move it this way the solid material will move the like chalk or something and if you move it this way to do you imagine what i'm talking about when you move it the the the, the solids on it it's going to change in either way so you move it like this to move this way it will move it like this so this is how we get the signal and this is how we get the equilibrium it looks like this so this is the statoconia over the gelatinous material. When you move this, this is going to move in a different way, bending these hair cells, the tops of the hair cells. This is what's going to be moving, and this is how we get the gravity and linear acceleration. It goes like, if you go like this, okay, the statoconia were moving away over the gelatinous material, and this movement will bend um, uh, the villi of or the of the cilia of uh, the the um, of the hair cells, and this is and this will tell you exactly which way you're moving. Are you moving this way or are you moving this way? Okay, like this. This is a plate, and this is gelatinous material, and the statoconia on top, which is a solid material. When you move this way, it's going to move. You move this way, it's going to move backward, and so on. So this movement is going to bend the cilia of the hair cells in a way that tells you if you're bending like this or like this, okay? Linear acceleration, same thing. What happens if you are like in the car and whoever the driver all of a sudden accelerate? Aren't you going to go like, like this, right? Automatically you'll do this movement, your, your head will bend backward, right? When you do this, which is linear acceleration, all of a sudden the jello will move and these cilia will move backward bending, and this will give a signal and tell your brain that you're moving in a linear way, linear acceleration. Same thing for gravity. Okay? Are we following so far? Are we following from the start, from the oracle, all the way until we get to the hair cells, from which we go to the neuron, which is the nerve, Vestibulococular nerve. What's the vestibulococular means? Vestibulo means it originates from the vestibule. Cochlear means it originates from the cochlea. So obviously, the vestibule, or the vestibular branch of the vestibulococular nerve, this is what's going to carry what? the vestibular nerve, or the vestibular part of the vestibulococular nerve, this is the part of the nerve that will carry what type of sensation? Huh? What is it? Equilibrium, yes, equilibrium. And the cochlear branch is going to carry what type of sensation? Hearing. So at the end, the vestibulococular nerve will carry two sensations, equilibrium and hearing, right? Vestibulo cochlear. It will originate from the vestibule and cochlea. So at the end, you will have the vestibulo cochlear nerve that's carrying those two sensations. So at nerve number eight is not only for hearing, it's two components. The vestibular part is responsible for equilibrium, and the cochlear part is responsible for hearing. The vestibular part will go to the vestibular ganglia, the cochlear part will go to the cochlear ganglia, and they will go. If you see this picture here, they will go to the vestibular and cochlear nuclei from which it will ascend all the way until it goes to the auditory cortex. So when you go to the vestibular nuclei, okay, what's the function of the vestibule again? In one word, the most important, equilibrium. Okay, equilibrium. So equilibrium will start from the vestibule, which include gravity and linear acceleration, yes, from the vestibular complex. So you're having the gravity, you're having the, the static and dynamic equilibrium, equilibrium, okay? So equilibrium is a function of the vestibular complex. The vestibular complex is two parts. Vestibule, which is responsible for static equilibrium, and the semicircular canal responsible for dynamic equilibrium. Details, vestibule, Gravity and linear acceleration. Semicircular canal, rotation and dynamic movement. Are we following? 
When I repeat something, know that this is important, right? I'm not just repeating something for no reason. It is important. You have to remember this, okay? So this is what you get at the end. The vestibular complex will give you equilibrium from the two components. This will go to the vestibular nucleus inside your brain. What's the vestibular nucleus do? It will not only take the equilibrium. The equilibrium is a very complex sensation. It's not that simple. It's not a function of the vestibular complex only. What else is responsible for equilibrium and balance? Which part of your brain? Does anybody remember the components, different parts of the brain? Yes, who said cerebellum? Yes, cerebellum. Do you remember that the cerebellum is responsible for one of the things is balance, right? So how you balance yourself? I balance myself through, through the vestibular complex. This is in the ear. Through the cerebellum as well. So it will coordinate those together. So the vestibular nuclei will get sensation of balance and equilibrium from both sides. You have one ear, right ear, left ear. Right vestibular complex, left vestibular complex, right? Both of them will go to the vestibular nuclei. So you're, you're integrating the sensation when you get from this ear that you're tilting to the right. And you get from this ear that you're tilting to the right. Both of them will come together and the vestibule, uh, the vestibular nucleus will detect this sensation that you're moving to the right. Same if you're moving to the left and so on. The second thing is the vestibular nuclei are going to, to relay the information from the vestibular complex to cerebellum. Do you remember when we talked about the cerebellum in 233? Do you remember the functions, the basic functions? Cerebellum is responsible for balance. Anybody remember the BPM? Oh, balance, position. Yes, and muscle movement, yes. Balance, position, of BPM. This is, I abbreviated the, the cerebellum just to remember it. BPM, BPM. B is for balance. P is for position. M is for muscle movement, right? And how the cerebellum will help you to keep your balance. You have to give input to the cerebellum. One of the inputs will come from the vestibular nucleus, right? Who is the master of the balance in your body? Cerebellum, okay? The master of the balance in your body is cerebellum. For the cerebellum to do the work, you have to give input from the vestibular nuclei. That's one. You have to also give input from your eye movement. Doesn't your eye movement say something to your cerebellum? Right? If you're not looking, if you can't see, what's the difference if you're moving like this and closing your eye and you're opening your eye? Does it make a difference? Can't you trap and fall down if, you're, if you can't see? Right? Because you are depreciating your cerebellum from one of the sensations. You should get, you should get the input from your vestibule, vestibular complex, and from ear, your ears as well, right? This is how our cerebellum do the function. The cerebellum nuclei will also connect to the, cerebellar, to, the cere, uh, to the cerebral cortex, okay? So to give you a conscious sensation of the head position and movement, you have to be aware. Your cerebral cortex should know exactly your position, okay? And it will also send motor commands to the nuclei in the brain stem and spinal cord. What does that mean? It means the vestibular nuclei will know that you're moving backward, for example, and you have to contract these muscles to keep your balance. If you are tilting this way, you're not going to fall. Why? Because the muscles here are going to contract, right? To keep your balance. So vestibular com complex, number one, get sensation from the two vestibular complex. Number two, communicate with cerebellum, cerebral cortex, and the motor nuclei. Are we following so far? Any question? Eye movement will also help you to keep your, your balance because when you, when you move your eye right and left, we talked about the eye, right? 
from, from the eye, optic nerve, followed by what's after the optic nerve? Optic chiasm, chiasm first, and then optic tract. We talked about that uh, Tuesday, didn't we? I showed you guys the pathway and I said it's important, right? Do you guys study same day or next day? No? You should. You should. As I mentioned before, this is your pr primary memory. If you don't consolidate your primary memory into secondary memory, it will evaporate. And you lose a lot every day. So the best thing to do is same day, next day. The more you wait every day, you lose like 10% or more, depending on your memory. So try to, to study that as, as we go. So you start from the eye, the receptors, optic nerve, optic chasm, optic tract, geniculate, lateral geniculate body, optic radiation, right? And then to the colliculi of the mesencephalon. Do you remember the colliculi? Of course not. What are you talking about? <laughs> we don't remember the vestibular cochlear nerve. Do you remember the corpora quadrigemina? What are you talking about? You, you don't remember that? Do you remember the four bodies in the back of the midbrain? Those four yeah. bodies in the back? The corpora quadrigemina? The two, four bodies, yeah. This, the two up are superior colliculi and the two under are the inferior colliculi. So superior colliculus, this is what's going to detect the eye movement. So you try, you always try to keep focus on a specific point, okay? So if I, if, I, if I ask you to focus on my finger like this, and you're moving, you will try at the beginning to keep focusing on the same point or, or, or your finger. If you move faster, you will see that your finger is actually jumping. Your eyes will be jumping, okay? So the eye move like this first, and then it will jump, okay? If you're spinning faster. Now what's nystagmus? This is what we're just talking about. It's an abnormality of this movement. You cannot control your eye movement. And I mentioned before, any abnormality is important, right? Any abnormality is important. So what's a nystagmus? If you know somebody, like if you try to focus, his eyes are moving right and left. Even if he's talking to you, he's trying to focus, he cannot control his eyes. Did you see somebody like this before? The eyes keep on moving right and left. Yeah, he cannot control it. This is called nystagmus. And this is a problem either in the inner ear or at the brainstem. One of those is having a problem, and he's actually trying to, to keep focusing, but he can't. The eye is moving. He cannot control it. He's having a problem in the brainstem or the inner ear. Having to do with what? Uh, no, I'm not sure. No, no, this is, this is something else. The, the, this is one type of the, um, of the squints, which is um, an, an ability to control one of the muscles. It's not, it's not moving right and left like this. It's one, one of them is weak enough that it will move away. This is something else. But this is like moving right and left, and you cannot stop it. This is what nystagmus is. Okay. Now how the, your cochlear duct, so we have three different types of ducts, vestibular duct and cochlear duct is two of them, are two of them, and how to detect the frequency of the sound versus the intensity. How to know the frequency versus if it is loud or, or not loud. The frequency will be determined by which part is stimulated. When you stimulate this part, this will give you a frequency. This is a tube, okay? And if you stimulate this part, it's different than this, than this. So which part of the tube are you stimulating? This will give you the frequency. The intensity is the number of hair cells stimulated. So when you move this jello-like material, it's going to bend the cilia, okay? And the, the amount of bending will give you, or how many hair cells did you stimulate? That will give you the intensity or the volume. The other two ducts are called vestibular duct and tympanic duct. So we have three 
different ducts, and you will see that in the lab. Inside the inner ear, or inside the inner ear, um, the, uh, the ear inside, you will see, inside the inner ear, you will see three ducts like this. These three ducts are vestibular, cochlear, and tympanic. And there is something called organ of corti. And this organ of corti is, respons is the one that's responsible for hearing. This is the hearing complex. And do not forget this. The hearing complex or the hearing organ is the organ of corti. Okay? And you can be asked about this in lecture and lab. The organ of corti. What's the organ of corti? This is the organ within your middle ears, in between these ducts, that is that contain the hair cells, and it's responsible for generation of hearing. Organ of corti is the organ of hearing. Okay. And here are the three ducts I was talking about. This is the vestibular duct. This is tympanic duct, and in the middle, this is the cochlear duct, and this part which when you magnify it, looks like this. So what is this? This is the organ of corti. The organ of corti is the organ of hearing. This is how we start our hearing process. There are two parts, pictorial membrane from one side, the basilar membrane, and the hair cells are in between. So what, it's three parts. What is the organ of corti? The organ of corti is the organ of hearing. This is the hearing organ. This is what? start our hearing process. It consists of two membranes and hair cells in between. This is called the pectoral membrane, this is called the basilar membrane, and the hair cells are in between. So when you move the hair cells, a stimulus or an action potential will be generated, go to the nerve, the cochlear nerve, and it will continue in the pathway. So this is the organ of corti. What's the organ of corti again? It's the organ of Hearing. It's responsible for hearing. This is how we start the hearing process. It's, it consists of two membranes and hair cells in between. Tuctorial membrane, which is a free-ended membrane, basilar membrane, and in between are the hair cells. If you put those three together, this will make the organ of corti. And again, this is important for everything. Lecture on that. So the sound is nothing but the air vibration. It's air vibration, and it goes in waves. These waves are called the sine waves because it looks like an S shape. That's why they call it the sine waves. And the wavelength is the distance between two adjacent waves. So if you look at this, this is one wave, and here's another wave. So the difference between each two waves this will be the wavelength, okay? Frequency is a number of waves per given time, number of waves, and usually you do it per second. Hertz is a number of cycles per second. This is, when you hear about Hertz, Hertz, this is a number of cycles per, per second. How many cycles per second? Okay, so the frequency can go up, can go down, 5 per second, 2 per second, 5 is higher frequency than 2, and so on. The pitch, on the other hand, is the sensory response to the frequency. The amplitude is the intensity of the sound wave, and this is measured by decibel. So frequency is measured by hertz. Amplitude is measured by decibel. You can read this if you want to, but it's not uh, the most important part. And this is summarizing the whole hearing process that we mentioned before. Starting from the sound arriving, the sound is arriving, which is the vibration, to the auricle, which is the penna, to the external auditory canal, to the tympanic membrane, to which of the ossicles first? What's after the tympanic membrane? Which ossicle attached to the tympanic membrane? 
How many ossicles do you have? Three. Which one is it's the first one that's attached to the tympanic membrane? Start with what? M. Malleus. Malleus followed by Incus. Followed by what's after the sapis? Oval window. Oval window. When it moves in, it's going to move the fluid inside. And the fluid will move all the way until it goes to the round window. And the round window will alleviate the pressure, accommodate the movement of the fluid. When you do this, when you move the fluid in one side and the other side, this is going to move the hair cells. Okay, so the pressure will move the, the, uh, at the oval window. It will move the fluid inside. And this will move the hair cells, stimulating them. The hair cells will start making or forming action potential that will travel through the nerve in the pathway that we mentioned. So this is basically um, the pathway. This is a very short video just describing this process. Just putting them all together. Just two minutes. The middle ear and the inner ear. The ear has three parts. The outer ear or oracle. The middle ear and the inner ear. The oracle, the visible part of the ear, collects sound waves and directs them to the auditory canal. The auditory or ear canal is lined with cilia and ceruminous glands. Earwax from the ceruminous gland and the cilia protect the ear from entry by foreign matter. The thin tympanic membrane separates the outer ear from the middle ear. Sound waves cause it to vibrate. The three tiny bones of the middle ear are the hammer, or malleus, anvil, or incus, and stapes, or stirrup. These bones pick up the vibrations from the tympanic membrane and transmit them to the inner ear. The eustachian tube of the middle ear opens into the pharynx and permits air pressure to equalize between the ear and the outside air. The inner ear is maze-like, consisting of bony and membranous structures surrounded by fluid. The semicircular canals are fluid-filled bony loops that help maintain our body's balance. The cochlea is a fluid-filled, snail-shaped structure that houses the organ of cordy, the true organ of hearing. The fluid aids in the transmission of the vibrations. The organ of Cordy changes the vibrations into nerve impulses that are picked up by the auditory nerve. Sound waves are collected by the auricle, or outer ear, and sent to the auditory canal, tympanic membrane, ear bones, and then to the cochlea, where the vibrations are changed by the organ of Cordy to nerve impulses and transmitted by the auditory or cochlear nerve to the temporal lobe of the brain for interpretation. Okay, so this is the hitting process and how it goes. It's summarized. I'm not going to go through it again. Okay, so moving from the vestibular cochlear nerve going to the vestibular nucleus, nucleus to the cochlear nucleus, and then it will go to the inferior colliculi where it's going to cross, and then it will ascend further going to the auditory cortex. Inferior colliculi, the corpora quadrigemina are four colliculi, right? Two superior and two inferior. The two superior pick the eye movement, and the two inferior will pick the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the action potential or the signal that's coming from the ears. The hearing range. The hearing range, you can, you can hear from 
the, the smallest to the largest um, hearing, rate, um, uh, hearing sound from the loudest to the softest. And usually this range decreases by age. Okay? So children have the greatest range. And if you did that personally, or, or if you know somebody who did that of the kids, my, one of my son actually did that, and it, it was not very nice. <laughs> they, they get that um, uh, device, I don't know what is it called, and it will produce sound that the teacher cannot hear. It's too soft. This is the range in children, and this is the range in adult. Okay? This is the range. So children can hear anything that's very soft to very loud. Okay? We can hear as you grow, you can hear from here to here. So anything that's less or softer, we can't hear it. Nothing. And they start to do that and produce the sound. So when you do the sound, the other kid will, I can hear you. <laughs> and teacher is not even there. It's undetectable, completely nothing, silent. Okay? Because it's beyond, they know that, obviously. So they get these devices. <laughs> Whoever is doing these devices should be arrested. It's not nice. <laughs> but, but actually, I heard it a lot. Like kids in uh, high school or middle school or something, they do it. If, if I need something from you, I will do this sound. Okay, when you hear the sound, look at me. I'll tell you something. I'll give you something, something like that. And obviously, the teacher cannot even say anything because she didn't hear nothing. It's beyond her range. So the range in, in children is higher, and it will decrease by age. Okay, they usually use the softest one, which is undetectable by adults. But anyway, the range decreases as we age. Okay, the, the extremes will not be picked up as we age. So what happened in aging? Everything deteriorates. This is the rule of the thumb. Everything deteriorates. Choose the bad part. Everything deteriorates. Tympanic membrane. The movement is less. The number of nerve fibers, less. The, the, the tympanic membrane will become stiff, less movement. Articulation, there is an articulation, it's actually a joint, it's a bone. The ossicles are bone, right? The ossicles are tiny bone. Being bones, there are joints in between these bones, and this joints or articulation will be stiffer. And this is what, what is um, explaining what I just talked about. If, if the sound is too soft, it will move the, the eardrums, very slight movement. So this very slight movement should be reflected by the ossicles. And if the ossicles are stiff, they are not going to move. And that's why it doesn't even produce sound. Um, the round window also began to ossify. And that's it for this um, chapter.